Hey friends, welcome to Chapel Live uh, with our Daily Bread Ministries. We'd love to know where you're joining us from. So in the comments, if you would, um, just put city, city, state, uh, country, wherever you're joining us from. Um, also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, our team is monitoring, moderating the comments. And so uh, if you have any prayer requests, please just put those in the comments so that we can be praying with you. Uh, and for you uh, during kind of a tumultuous time. Um, in fact, that's kind of where I just want to start today. Um, I don't know about you, but I have felt the weight of these past um, couple weeks. And, you know, between coming out of coronavirus into just some of the horrific things that we've seen uh, happen in, in our country, um, I've gone through like the whole series of emotions from frustration to anger, um, confusion, uh, not knowing what to say, being nervous. And so, you know, maybe as you're uh, joining us, maybe you don't have a prayer request, um, like a big prayer request of, you know, someone who's sick or something like that. Uh, but maybe you have a prayer request where it's simply like, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling frustrated, uh, I'm feeling alone or isolated, or I don't know how to respond, or I'm at a loss for words. Um, would you share those with us too so that we can be praying with you through that? Because those are big prayer requests to God too. Um, and be praying with us here at Our Daily Bread as uh, we navigate all of this together. Um, so my name is Daniel Ryan Day. I'm a producer for podcasting here at Our Daily Bread Ministries. I'm also a writer for Our Daily Bread. Uh, and I do want to draw your attention to one of the podcasts that um, we've recently launched called Where You're From that features stories of people that might have grown up in the same city um, as many of us, but who have very different stories, uh, very different experiences that we have. Uh, that has been a very helpful podcast to me in processing a lot of what we're seeing going on in the world. And so again, that's called Where You From, uh, the letters Y-A, where Y-A from, uh, .net is where you can find that. You can find it on iTunes. I uh, just want to invite you to, um, to listen to that with us as well. The story that I'm going to be sharing today is out of John chapter 11. Um, so if you want to turn in your Bibles there, you can. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let's get started. Uh, it was a short message, but a desperate one. Lord, he whom you love is sick. It was a message that didn't need any more context than he whom you love. And it was true. Jesus had referred to Lazarus as not only a friend of Jesus, um, but a friend to the disciples. And Jesus had already healed so many, he had rescued many. Uh, Jesus had even already raised a few people from the dead, and those people were mostly strangers. They weren't described as the one whom you love. They weren't described as friends, at least not yet. They were just people in need, some of who... Uh, they interrupted Jesus, some whom uh, stopped Jesus on the side of the road, some who reached out to Jesus and touched him without permission. So if Jesus healed, if he rescued people he didn't know, surely he would come for his friend, for the one whom he loved. And Jesus didn't just love Lazarus. Jesus also loved those who asked Jesus for help. He loved Lazarus' sisters. Jesus loved Mary enough to risk his reputation, to defy social norms, to invite her to sit at his feet with his disciples and to learn from him. Jesus loved Martha enough to challenge her anxious worries and her distractions. Later, Jesus accepted the politically incorrect inappropriate even, uncomfortable sacrifice of Mary, who poured perfume on Jesus' feet and dried that perfume with her hair. Jesus loved Lazarus' sisters. And now Lazarus was sick, and it was a sickness that looked like it was leading to death. And so they knew exactly who they should run to. They should run to the man who healed even strangers. They should run to the man who loved their brother, who was a friend to their brother, they should run to the man, the friend who loved them. Yet Jesus waited. Why, Jesus? Why would you wait? 
Why would you wait an extra two days? Why would you not rush to Lazarus's bedside? Why would you not walk through the night to sit by Mary and Martha in their distress and in their pain? Jesus waited for two days. Jesus waited while Lazarus took his final breath. Jesus waited while Mary and Martha's anxious worries turned to despair. Jesus waited while Lazarus' friends, his whole community, his family, went from worry to weeping. Can I just pause here for a moment and relate this to where we are today? It was a short message, but a desperate one. I can't breathe. And it's led to many other short and desperate messages. Black Lives Matter, Love Not Hate. Am I next? Hands up, don't shoot. Lord, have mercy. These messages are being spoken and prayed by people that Jesus loves because Jesus loves the whole world. We know who to run to when things like this happen. We know that only God can fix something like this. Only God can heal hearts and souls and minds and bodies. Only God can bring peace. Only God can rescue our cities. Only God can open our eyes to see our blind spots, those places where we've actually added to the problem. Only God can bring awareness and bring healing. Yet it feels like God's waiting. Why, God, why are you waiting? Why would you not rescue George Floyd? Why would you not rescue Ahmaud Arbery? Why are you allowing our cities to burn? Why did you allow slavery in the first place? Why do these stories keep repeating themselves? Why, God, what are you waiting for? Yet it feels like God is waiting. Back to our story. Jesus heard Mary and Martha's short and desperate message and decided to help, despite the danger to himself. His disciples reminded him, Jesus, do you remember that the religious leaders of the city were trying to kill you by throwing stones at you? Yet despite the danger to himself, Jesus heard Mary and Martha's short and desperate message and decided to help. Jesus heard Mary and Martha's short and desperate message and decided to help, despite the fact that he knew he would be misunderstood by the religious leaders. With a metaphor, Jesus admits that not everybody's going to understand what he's up to. Not everybody's going to get it. They aren't going to understand and they're going to blame him. And he describes some of this misunderstanding as those people are walking in darkness. They're stumbling around. They're blind to the truth. Don't we feel the same way right now, like we're stumbling around in the darkness? Yet Jesus heard Mary and Martha's short and desperate message and decided to help despite knowing that he would be misunderstood by the religious leaders. Jesus heard Mary and Martha's short and desperate message and decided to help despite being misunderstood by Mary and Martha. But that's getting ahead of our story. Jesus heard Mary and Martha's desperate message and decided to help. He listened to them. Then Jesus arrived. Mary stayed home in sorrow. Martha left and ran to Jesus. And out of her sorrow, Martha blamed Jesus for not being there. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Are we brave enough? to join Martha and admit our feelings of blame toward God. Yet Martha also declared her trust in Jesus and in Jesus' Father and God. Martha said, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Are we humble enough to join Martha and admit that we don't know why? Admit that we don't know how? Admit that we don't know when? But we still hold on to the truth that somehow God can work good even out of the bad situations that we see around us. And then Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. 
and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And Martha responded, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Then Jesus called for Mary. Jesus didn't let Mary stay home in her sorrow. Jesus didn't think to himself, I'm going to let her have her space right now. Jesus called to her. And she got up quickly to go to him. And Mary arrives weeping out of her sorrow with words broken by heavy heaves and tears. Mary blamed Jesus for not being around. Mary said the same words that her sister Martha had said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, are we brave enough to admit feelings of blame toward God? Jesus saw her weeping. Jesus saw all the people that had come with Martha or with Mary and saw them weeping. Jesus wept. Can we pause in our story again for a moment? If you want to know how God reacts to situations like the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, or the many others that we could put in their place, Jesus wept. If you want to know how God reacts to the death of hundreds of thousands of people to coronavirus, Jesus wept. If you want to know how God reacted to the burning of our cities, to the riots and destruction, to the firefighters who have been injured by protesters, to the police officers who feel caught between injustice and duty, Jesus wept. If you want to know how God reacts to situations of injustice, to racism that denigrates men and women that are made in the image of God, Jesus wept. And that's our first invitation, I think, in this story, to weep. To weep at the brokenness we see in the world. To weep at injustice. To weep at disease. To weep at displays of uncontrolled anger. To weep at systems of prejudice. Weep. Do not suppress these feelings of discomfort. Don't put on a happy face. Admit feelings of anger, admit feelings of confusion, admit feelings of frustration. Join Jesus and join those around you in weeping over the brokenness of the world. Again, back to our story. Just in case we missed it the first time, the author John reminds us again, says it again, that Jesus' spirit was greatly disturbed within him. The waves of emotion that we've been describing were rolling over Jesus just like they roll over us. Jesus asked for the stone to be removed and Martha pushes back. It's going to smell bad. He's been in there four days. Jesus replied, trust me, Martha. Jesus prayed. Lazarus came back from light, came back to life. And most people rejoiced, but not everyone. Mary and Martha rejoiced. The city, the community that saw what Jesus did, they believed and rejoiced. But many of the religious leaders decided as a result of Jesus raising Lazarus that it was time for Jesus to die. Jesus saved Lazarus, which condemned himself. This story doesn't answer all of our why questions. Why does injustice happen? Why do hundreds of thousands die in coronavirus? Why did God not rescue George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery? Why are our cities allowed to burn? This story does not answer all of our why questions. But this story echoes with the groaning that we feel inside of us and see in the world right now. This groaning for all things to be made right. The scriptures say that all the world groans in pain, waiting for redemption. And today, we don't need anyone to convince us that evil exists. Today, we don't need anyone to convince us that our world is broken. Today, we don't need anyone to convince us that men and women are capable of doing really horrific things. This story echoes with the groaning in all of us for all to be made right. And Jesus shows us 
that God groans too. Jesus saw how the brokenness of the world affected his friends, and Jesus wept. Jesus sees how the brokenness of the world is affecting us, and he calls us friends. And Jesus weeps. And Jesus isn't the only one. In the same passage where it talks about the world groaning, Romans chapter 8, it also talks about the spirit who groans with sighs too deep for words. When it comes to our groaning and our pain and our tears, our tears are not just prayers that God hears. Our tears are prayers that God feels. Jesus shows us that God groans too. God groans with us. But Jesus doesn't just weep. He brings life. He brings hope. Jesus laid down his own safety. He laid down his own reputation. He laid down his very life to rescue us and to rescue the world. Just like in the situation with Lazarus, Jesus saved Lazarus and condemned himself. Jesus saves us by being condemned and dying for us. And that's our calling too, to weep, yes, especially with our brothers and sisters of color especially with our friends and families who have lost loved ones, to weep especially with our cities. But then, like Jesus, we are called to bring life and to bring hope. We're called to lay down our safety and our reputation and our lives for one another. And through the power of the Spirit, through God's help, we can do just that.